My name's Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Jim, I said it before, I'm going to say it again. How can we get you to miss us if we never go away? <laughs> <laughs> Year number four of Wizard with number 37, September 1994. And little Eddie P, 13 years old. Uh, this is my first Wizard. I remember everything about it, man. In fact, I was so young that I got this from a drugstore when I stayed home from school one day. And my pops took me into the drugstore to... F uh, to fill a prescription of mine. It was the last time I got some of that pink bubblegum moxicillin cough syrup. I was that little, man. I can't believe you remember that so well. <laughs> it was it was a it was a I guess it is Wizard magazine. <laughs> you know what it was? It was before this, I saved up a week's worth of lunch money to get to get uh Batman versus Spawn. And that was a big deal to me. This is my first trade magazine, Jim. I, <laughs> I, I saved up a whole week's worth of lunch money, not to get five comics, but to get one magazine where people are talking about comics. That was a big step for me, dude. Yeah, I, I'm air quoting for you when you say trade magazine. Ed. <laughs> <laughs> so since I did get this at the, uh, at the drugstore, this is the cover that I got. So I actually, to break kayfabe, I, I grabbed both of these. Like I was just you know out on the hunt and came across I th probably this issue when I was doing a dollar so and this is like the start of cartoonist kayfabe essentially like I came across this and was like oh my god I haven't looked in this fucking magazine for over 20 years I committed this magazine to memory and this channel exists because I want other people to feel that feeling that I felt at that <laughs> very moment man well I'm I'm eager to get into that but before we do I have two questions for you Ed yes. first of all you knew of Wizard before this issue? I, I honestly did not, man. I never paid attention to okay. that sort of thing. It's a pretty random find on that uh, fateful sick day. And you know what it was? It was this that got ah. me to uh, buy it. The Rob Liefeld and the Masthead, man. I, I was a huge Rob Liefeld mark. I'm, I'm trying to rack my brain, and, and I, I must have known about Youngblood, because I knew about Spawn and Batman and all that, so I must have had a Youngblood comic or two. But uh, I never heard, I never heard um, from the man himself. Well, uh, I'll give Wizard some credit. Whoever was designing and putting together this cover, it's nice that they avoid the redundancy. If you get the Liefeld cover, seeing his art is enough. We don't have to see the name too, and vice versa. The other thing I have to note here is early digital painting, right? I guess that's what that is, right? I, I, I think I'm pretty sure that's digitally painted, as near as I can tell. And in 1994. I don't know what they would have been using. Um, you know, Photoshop existed in 1994, and it might have been Photoshop 1 or 2. Um, but I don't know. Would you would you be drawing with a mouse? I, remember I, I don't know. Seeing, I remember seeing styluses on on TV in the in the mid-90s. So I think Wacom and styluses existed. We're going to get into some some uh, early kind of digital stuff as we as we unpack the issues, man. So if you don't mind, I'm going to prefer to to go with sure. the the uh the tried and true AP cover. I am I am totally the uh riding shotgun on this one, so <laughs> knock yourself out. So we're in year 4 of Wizard Magazine, man, the beginning of year 4, and I'm going to call this like the licensing issue or something where very prominent creators are attaching their names to some bullshit. And we started off right, man. <laughs> if if we were to get alone in a room, man, and conduct a sh shoot interview with like Leonard Nimoy, Gene Roddenberry, Gaiman or Spillane, and we were to ask them, <laughs> what was the easiest check you ever received in your entire life, man? If it's not uh, licensing their name to Techno Comics, then, then they live even more priv privileged lives than I thought. That's funny. I thought you were going to go a different direction and ask them about Primordials and hear them say, what? Yeah. <laughs> Who's John Jakes? Do you know? I don't know that name, no. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. I also didn't know Silverberg, the, the bottom name there. I don't know DC Fontana neither, man. I've heard of DC Fontana, but I can't tell you why. <laughs> Look at this, man. They're even on the NASDAQ. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Publicly traded company. The Techno Comics is so bad. So bad. Yeah, there's not one redeeming quality. And 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 it's as jobber as jobber can be, man. Like everybody is just cash and checks. Horrible. Zero month, man. The beginning of tomorrow. 
What a fucking snoozer, man. <laughs> <laughs> You're so right. My uh, my wizard actually had like an insert for zero month, which was kind of the height of stupid because it's all the DC characters with just the zero next to them. Very little useful information of any sort. Just a listing of like Superman zero. It's A's gimmicks. Pop, Flash zero. It's worth Aquaman it just for the zero. black and white uh, Brian Ball in peace. I'm glad you said it. That's the only thing that stood out in this to me. <laughs> yeah, it's such like a, a big good pile of hokums. When I had this when I was a little dude, I colored these in all with magic marker. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, for for it might even be in there later, man, but in the 1990s, mid-90s, this is what Dr. Fate turns into. Wow. I thought it was Ravage 2099 for a second, like, <laughs> photo bombing. Oh, fuck. Jimmy, did you pull anything from the letters column? No, I didn't. Um, also, nothing from the publisher page. He really is just outlining what's in this issue. Uh, often he plugs, you know, upcoming things or whatever, but... Not much here. This is when uh, I start seeing these little comic book covers. And when I see these actual comics in the wild, I scoop them up. Like, so the impression that Wizard gave us, man, by just putting these little thumbnails, they had some relevance, man. They definitely uh, colored my back issue bins. Speaking of lousy character designs, yeah. look at that Ultra Force group. <laughs> I know. Uh, there's... There, there were guys in the 90s who had their finger on the pulse of, like, what, cool. And we're going to see time and time again, man, examples of the exact opposite, man. And, and this Ultra Force definitely fits that bill. Good envelope art, this issue. Always a highlight. And here's what I mean, man, about, like, you know, this is your Alpha Omega type shit. It's like Team 7. How fucking cool is this? Bandoliers of bullets, Aaron Weasenfield going crazy on the ones and twos, man. We have some crazy characters in the background shooting two guns at once. Look at this guy. Uh, very dynamic. Yes. You flip the page. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this Peckerwood nonsense, swashbuckling bullshit. Wow. <laughs> But, I forgot how low Valiant goes. <laughs> like I'm checked out on them several like Armorines like like four books ago. Time Walker. Yeah. Look at that character design. I mean, I don't want to cut promos on Don, Don Parlum because I have mad respect for his G.I. Joe work and stuff. But he was probably an old fucking dude at this point, and they just couldn't compete with the young energy of, of the image cats, man. Impossible. Speaking of the image cats. Yes. First announcement of the uh, Image X Month books. I love this gimmick. This is one of my favorite things that they did. This is one of my favorite, like, gimmick, crossover, whatever you want to call it from this era. The X month was the best idea anybody had at this time, as far as I was concerned. And looking back, I'm still on board. This is a perfect idea. It's all the image guys using their talent. The, the, the thing that they have is themselves. And so what's a crossover? Let's all draw each other's books. Yeah. And, Badass. And this is... Uh, this is definite kayfabe where they talk about an industry insider, Toad Wizard, blah, blah, blah. and But they got it all wrong, man. Right. Uh, they might have got one right. Like, the ones that I know for sure, Silvestri did Spawn. I know Valentino did Youngblood. Liefeld did do Shadowhawk, mm -hmm. correct? Uh, Jim Lee did Savage Dragon. And what was what was the other gimmicks? What did Larson do? Larson did Wildcats. I don't think I've ever seen that issue. Um, well, you will eventually, because yeah. I, I, <laughs> I right. do have all these. But it, it's really fun. And you know what? I'm glad they, they don't have it right here. Like, this is the way to promote something. You know, like, this is the first mention of it, and it's not clear what's going to happen. This is a perfect concept, and it's a great promo, because they're just laying the grounds for it, and now you get to speculate with your buddies about, oh, man, I hope, I hope Todd McFarlane draws Savage Dragon. I still hope that. That would be an awesome issue. <laughs> um, but, you know, like, it's a really cool... I love all of it. Let's root this in a period of time one more time, man, where we have somebody who's cosplaying as Vera DeMilo, the Jim Carrey character from In Living Color. Wow. A lot of the news is all bollocks to me, man. Silvestri leaves homage is, is something worth noting because mm -hmm. inevitably Top Cow is going to be his, his, new, his new studio. But did you pull anything else, man? I did pull one. I always love whenever we see prices and auction stuff. Yeah. So the big one in there that I pulled out is Conan cover art by Barry Windsor Smith. Conan number one. Mm -hmm. Cover art sells for $12,000 at auction. Nice. 
that's a decent price at this time. I think a couple issues ago we saw Watchmen all 12 covers sell for a total of $12,000, which is the steal of the century. Creeps. That is retirement. <laughs> oh, man. Could you imagine if you're the guy that bought that in the early 90s? But uh, Conan cover number one for 12000 here. I was trying to figure out what that would be worth today. I, I didn't see it sell again, but issue five of Conan sold this year for $57,000. Damn. So... You know, Conan's one of those uh, noteworthy books of the of that bronze, you know, sort of in between silver bronze age era. I would guess that book is it, it's got to be a million dollar cover at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You provided some good context for that, man. The company updates. I don't remember it looking this way in the previous issue, but it'll it'll hold steady in this format for quite a while and i always like to bring up the fantagraphic stuff because almost everything else is nonsense to me uh peter bag's stuff is gonna i guess start going color uh around issue 16 and that book comes out uh five five times a year man which is pretty good frequency considering he's doing the bulk of everything on that yeah color alternative comic five times a year is <laughs> above and beyond <laughs> <laughs> let's root it in some time once again man phone cards the <laughs> next big thing man <laughs> and the one they go with is the dark <laughs> <laughs> and the and the idea is that these uh schmucks are going to be doing like comic art on phone cards or some shit it's a strange it is a strange bit of marketing right there and how about this uh controversy as they would say in in the uk there was this comic, Jimmy, called Lycra Woman and Spandex Girl. And they got that cease and desist letter from uh, DuPont, man. They didn't do their due diligence and realize that Lycra is a copywritten and trademarked uh, yeah. nomenclature, dude. <laughs> Again, it's a weird news item. <laughs> <laughs> this Manhunter, uh, you know, the Wizard's been doing these where they take a character and they kind of give the history of that character. In this issue, they're doing Manhunter, and they don't single out Walt Simonson's legendary piece on it. Yeah, and, um, that's, and that's a piece that... When you would see interviews with like a McFarlane, Liefeld, those guys, and when they would cite Walt Simonson, it was the Manhunter stuff that was that would stoke them out, man. So it is a glaring omission in this little gimmick right here. Uh, but the Liefeld proposal, <laughs> how did that turn right out? There. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that turned out great, man. And they just uh, they wanted to make note of it here, man. I believe we showed it off on a previous episode. Uh, it's funny. It's funny that that again. What makes the news items in Wizard Magazine? <laughs> Gamer's Guide, man. This is pretty much, uh, as far as I can tell, the if the first mention of Magic the Gathering uh, in Wizard Magazine, I believe. And it is worth noting because in these tumultuous 1990s, Magic the Gathering floated a lot of comic shops, man. Some of the comic shops that have weathered that storm and exist today uh, exist because... Uh, if not specifically for Magic the Gathering, from fucking Pokemon cards, and those were still put out by Wizards of the Coast. Yeah, good call. And Kitchen Sink has now been sold. Um, I don't know when they bought Tundra in, in Wizard. I remember there was the article of, of when they bought Tundra. We've unpacked that in other shows, you know, talking about history of Tundra and Kevin Eastman. And now Kitchen Sink is sold again. It's probably about within a year or so of, of the Wizard coverage of Kitchen Sink buying Tundra, and now it's going to some company that I think, if I understand it correctly, basically just buys up IP uh, in an effort to develop it in Hollywood or whatever. I don't think it ultimately goes anywhere. Kitchen Sink is just in for a tumultuous future, um, starting before this, but continuing forward, and, and I'm sure we'll see more coverage of that, but uh, kind of a noteworthy item because of that alternative comics connection that Kitchen Sink has. Yeah, man. Uh, the the beauty of it is Dennis Kitchen is going to remain as a publisher and president. And you know who the other major stockholder is? Former uh, Tundra publisher Kevin Eastman. So he's due to uh, receive big rewards. <laughs> I'm not positive that's how it works, but yes. <laughs> Here we go, dude. <laughs> Let me sit back. <laughs> is the blood back? Artist Rob Liefeld returns <clears throat> to comics, but will his bold new style be enough to win fans back? dude my first, first off, question for you yes is this a bold new style he's he's going farther down the path of like hera tetsuo fist of the north star he's shrinking the upper bodies he's increasing the legs size he's got danny miki on the inks to kind of like sharpen it up and give it that uh 
that what do you call it that Jim Lee kind of treatment. There's some new energy to it, and and Wizard is funny because they, in this issue and the next, they're ta- they'll, they sort of, believe the hype. They're like. We made fun of Rob Liefeld in the past, but his bold new style is breathtaking and energetic. What I will tell you right here, man, is this photograph right here with the bad rock. This this is what I wanted when I grew like grew up. I wanted like Venetian blinds. <laughs> I wanted like art on uh on my walls of like my characters. I wanted original art in stacks of my shit and uh my bedroom started to look like this afterward. I'm like drawing things, putting it up there, accumulating my own pages. Uh, this was this was what I wanted. This exact situation. Maybe even I wanted this bad rock. I was young enough to care about that sort of thing. It's a good shot of bad rock because I've seen this thing. You know, I, I think it was photographed quite a bit. Yeah. You buy one of these giant bad rock figures, sculpts, whatever they are. You're gonna show it off every chance you get. This is the best photo of it I've ever seen. Even like the detail in the mouth there and stuff. That thing looks pretty crazy and wild, and usually when I would see it, it would look very dopey. Yeah. So that's a good shot of it. It is. It is a suit, and and a guy does go in it. But when I was a kid at this time, I thought it was uh, animatronic because you ah. because you see this. It's not. Uh, but you see this thing in that uh, TV show, Name Your Adventure, <laughs> when Rob Liefeld says the same thing that he says somewhere in this in this interview uh, when a kid comes to visit Extreme Studios. And it asks Rob Liefeld, like, like, what gets you up in the morning? And he says, I get to see Stephen Platt's pencils before anybody. <laughs> like, he says that in the body yeah. of this interview, too, man. And the Bad Rock, like, greeted the little dude at the door of Extreme Studios, man. So, super rad. And that's what they're talking about. He, he, took, he took a powder, and now he's back with the Fury, man. He was running uh, the damn studio. Kid's 26 years old here. And he's lording over... You know, a team of dudes. Yeah, I can't imagine how hectic that had to be, the formation of Image the first year of that. Even coming off of the launch of X-Force, you know, like it's it's several years of what seems like it would have been round the clock, promo, work, coverage, attention. It's, uh, I, I don't know if you could do it if you were, say, 46 instead of 26. Yeah, you're probably, you're probably right. And this is... Um, this is an existential interview here, man. It's uh, it, like uh, Clifford Meth interviewing our guy like like he's an old queen or something, man. Uh, and and Rob is kind of like feeling that energy a little bit too. They keep bringing up, uh, in order to get their points across, man, do they throw uh, Neil Adams under the bus and run him over a few times. <laughs> Just saying stuff like, yeah, you remember when he was popular and like nobody even knows who he is at a show anymore. And then Rob is... Rob is like, yeah, you know, Wizard is like, uh, you know, Tiger Beat. They need a new teen idol all the time. They need to churn and burn. So I don't expect to be, you know, the flavor of the month like forever. It is funny. It is funny that tone of like he's he's passe or whatever at yeah. this point. Yeah, yeah, he's old man of 26. And it makes me wonder if when he sees that uh, top 10 at, 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 the, at like right before the price guide, Makes you wonder if he gets a little salty that he, that he's you know getting outranked by uh, I mean his co high Stephen Platt. He identifies himself in this interview as a publisher, you know, and that that's a big focus of what he does and his energy. So you know, seeing those guys climb up the top ten hot artists, uh, I, I do think it's something he he takes seriously. It's kind of a badge, you know, and and these image guys do get into little uh, battles over trying to. I guess pay talent better, you know, basically they get into these these competitions over getting the hot young artists on their books and in their stables and studios. So it's definitely a, a piece of what he's doing. Yeah, yeah. Another piece of what he's doing is bringing on some older cats that he liked when he was uh, growing up and stuff. One of those guys on the docket is uh, Dave Cockrum. He's going to do like a Futurians comic or something that I actually don't think comes out. I don't either. That was my note. I, I vaguely, rereading this, I vaguely remember there was talk of Futurians and Rob Liefeld's connection to that property in some way, but I don't think it was ever published. Yeah. He addresses a lot of the things that were cri- sort of critical of Young Blood early on, the first four issues. The stuff saying that, you know, Young Blood promised it was going to be one thing in interviews and never delivered on any of those promises 
And this is the part where Liefeld's like, I'm addressing all of that, man. We're going to have some pathos. Uh, we're going to get to know the characters a little bit, man. Uh, Vogue, I think she said like two words in that first four issue miniseries, man. We're going to, we're going to round out her, uh, we're going to round out her character. Did you know that she has an, uh, a cosmetics empire? <laughs> And she's a spokesmodel and stuff like that, man. It's all about image, you know? So, like, even Shaft, you know, he was, like, a top dog in the FBI. So they put a um, bow and arrow in his hand, man, and, and it turned out that he excelled at marksmanship. So uh, they, threw a, they threw a costume at him, said, here, man, you're the new leader of Youngblood. So, uh, you know, he has nightmares, wakes up in cold sweats uh, because he's manorexic, afraid he's going to be fat one day. <laughs> won't get to be the leader of uh, Youngblood anymore, man. Some of these ideas don't age great. <laughs> well, uh, Jim, I'll tell you, man, I was I was there, and I was 13, and they didn't really age that great then. <laughs> <laughs> it is funny hearing him talk about the these Youngblood not being all fight comics, all fight scenes. Right. Um, I think, you know... <clears throat> We'll get into numbers, I think, as we get if, as we continue through Wizard Year mm-hmm. Four. We're going to see some numbers of sales and see kind of like how the the mighty have fallen. Yeah, and I feel like a lot of what the the, the subtext of this interview is: my books used to sell a million, and now they sell a hundred thousand or one hundred fifty thousand. You know, it's not like they dropped off ten percent. It's like they dropped off eighty five percent. And I think that's what you're hearing here: is people going, "What is? Ha- I don't know. What, what else could it be? I'm old. You know, I'm no longer the shiny new toy, so my books aren't selling as well. Or they need to not be the action comics that I rose to prominence making. I think that, you know, if you understand how much sales have plummeted in a year or so, it may explain a little bit more of what we're hearing in this interview because it is. Somebody who's changing everything and emphasizing those changes. Yeah, good point, man. These are some of Rob's new characters that he's introducing in uh, Young Blood Six: Night Saber with the Flavor Saver Soul Patch, <laughs> the Robot Die Hard, and Troll, aptly named. What a cast! <laughs> what, what a crew those guys are. Here we get into more of the, uh, I guess, the style changes. Yeah. And there's a really great piece in here that I pulled out. He's talking about style, and he, and he references Eric Larson has said, style is everything you do wrong. Mm-hmm. I think that's a really interesting notion to begin with. You know, it's kind of what makes your style different than mine. Yeah. And then he goes on to say, when you start correcting those things, does it make you a boring artist? And my answer is yes. Fuck yes. Yeah, yeah, because then you become like a Don Heck, or, or, it, or you, it becomes like clip art. When I pull out a lot of these old black and white, like the self-published 80s stuff, the stuff that's very competent is the least interesting stuff mm-hmm. I pull out. I want that weird styles. You know, I want the stuff where it's like, this artist doesn't look like anybody else I've seen. And you get to be a certain competency level, it is very boring. It's what it, it's what bores me with uh, Jobber Comics, man, is like that high level of fetishization of the human figure to the point that these people can draw a body from the, their imagination twisted up in any pose and it just it's all perfect and i think you can pointless. look at stuff like valiant and ultraverse for this time period and that's what they suffer from yeah it's just a very it's probably better draftsman and, and anatomy understanding than i don't know some of this other stuff but it's just not interesting mm-hmm. yeah not, not too much more uh in this interview um, it was it was really cool reading uh, Rob's words and wisdom, man, when I was a young lad, though. This facing page right here with the ad, Kirby Lives, man, the Jack Kirby Unpublished unpub- Archives, collector cards by Comics Image, man. Uh, these look pretty freaking cool, man. I have a horrible confession to make, Ed. I have two sets of, of trading cards in my in my possession in my life. This is one of the sets. I pulled them and did not bring them over You today. know what? I'm glad you didn't. Because we'll do a show and tell yes. episode with them. That sounds good because they're definitely worth looking at. We see a lot of cards advertised in Wizard, and like you, I think this is a cooler looking card set than the average ones that we see. The inking on this looks so cool, man. Like if I had to guess, I would bet that's like William Stout ink in that or something. Interesting. Man. The other name we know from the Ruby Spears time period is Jim Woodring work there. Right. So it, it's definitely worth going through this stuff, and, and I'm glad to hear you say that. We will have a uh, do a piece on it. Look forward to it. 
David and Goliath, writer Peter David and editor Bobby Chase talk about the quote-unquote new Hulk and his savage personality. Jim, I never read this article then, and I didn't read it now. Did well, you pull any you're notes? smart. <laughs> I did read it, and I was also reading Hulk. When I started reading comics, the first comic I started reading was the Hulk. Let me ask you this question, man. Where does this Peckerwood, freaking Gary Frank Hulk uh, stack up in your lineage of favorite Hulks? Here's where it stacks up. This is when I quit, and that's the reason why. I hate this. He's a monster. Does this look like a monster? Yeah. I hated that version. Yeah, me too. I, like, that thing sucks so bad. I don't even know what happened in the comic to make him this wussy or whatever. But uh, It's real disappointing. The, the, uh, the thing that I did pull out of this article, though, is Peter David writes the Hulk for a long time. Yeah. At this point, I think he's about eight years into maybe a 12-plus year run. Mm -hmm. So eight years in, he has worked with guys like Todd McFarlane, I think was his first regular artist, Jeff Purvis, uh, Del Keown. Sam Keith had a great fill-in issue in there. Yeah. And, and now Gary Frank, who is a good cartoonist and does a lot of decent work. I just don't like this Hulk version. And some of it's the where the character was at the time is this like civil version of the Hulk. Yeah. Um, but Peter David talks about the challenges of having your artist switching out. And it's very obvious once you hear that, but it's not something I always think about. And you and I talk frequently about how a reader doesn't care about any of the backstory. Yeah. If the script was lost and the artist only had a couple days to turn it around, it means nothing. I'm looking at the comic and it's good or it's bad and that's all that matters. But if you're a writer... That's a real thing, man. That's a headache. You know, you get used to whatever the strength is of the person you're writing for, and then a fill-in issue happens, and suddenly everything, all the parts that are important aren't working in that issue. So that's tough. And what he's talking about here is Gary Frank is wrapping up his run, and uh, Liam Sharp is about to take over. Boy, look at this right here, man. When I, <laughs> when I saw this... That's exciting. I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm picking Hulk up again as soon as I find this thing. And, dude, going to uh, the comic shop, was actually a pretty rare morsel for me around this time period. I was picking my stuff up from the grocery store and the spinner racks still existed and the chromium cover, man, like when Liam Sharp gets on the on the uh, assignment for Hulk, that was there. I have it amongst these yes. 50,000 and I was looking for it. Uh, couldn't find it, but uh, I started picking it up again. On the strength of this singular image right here, I'm like, where have you been? By the way, I believe he's 26 at this point. Same age as Liefeld in this issue. And also, it's nice with Liam Sharp, still active today making comics and making comics that people seem to care about. So he's I always enjoy seeing that, too. He's a badass, man. Spider-Clone saga. That was one of those gimmicks that was going on at this time. <laughs> and, and enough time has passed that I see people cosplaying like with this with this character nowadays. They have a fondness for him. I think the Spider-Clone thing is generally dis disliked, the storyline. But I do think people like the costume. I, I see them uh, praise that part. Oh, somebody claimed their dooms, dooms <laughs> for one half. <laughs> Brett Booth on a backlash. This uh, drawing board, it's like female uh, uh, Vampirella. Yeah, there's a, con a Vampirella contest. And I think all of these are great. <laughs> they are all pretty good. It's it's. Uh, they said in their little intro over a thousand entries for this, which is wild. And they keep pointing out um, Demorellas. So like, I guess, demon versions of this character. And there are three of them. So there's kind of a running gag, uh, you know, as they, as they pop up. Right. There are also three Preda Predatorellas. And those aren't even mentioned. <laughs> Predator was so huge around this exact time, man. Like when I was getting into comics that were sort of outside of Marvel DC. It's like me and my homies, we were grabbing uh, the Predator miniseries, man. We were re-watching those videos on, on VHS a bunch. And just like the costume, I could I could pull out old drawings of like little Predator looking guys, man. Predator was the first R-rated action movie I ever saw in a theater. So it was like burnt into my head, probably the way this issue's burned into yours. The first, the first Predator? The first Predator, Damn, man. You, you old life, man. Life changing. <laughs> <laughs> so big for me. But it was also some of the first indie comics I ever bought were the Predator comics. Jim, you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm in good company, though, because Frazetta is going to drop some Predator love later this very issue. This one disturbed me. Yeah, I don't like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although I don't know if that's any better. <laughs> Roots and Bays with the three-point perspective. This is all sound information. It's not the most exciting column that he's put together, but it all makes sense. Perspective is one of those things that 
it's almost like figure anatomy. It's uh, it's a thing everybody wrestles with to, to different degrees of success. Cut and print. Dave Galvin. Um, Michael Keaton is out. Val Kilmer is in. He's going to be Batman in Batman 3. Uh, Batman Forever. They also have an interview here with Jim Lee about the uh, Wildcats animated series. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a kayfaber out there named Rich Dennis, man, who, who worked at uh, Nelvana, the, the, the Canadian animation studio that did the work on uh, Wildcats, man. So shouts to him. That's a pretty cool thing. But uh, Jim Lee's just getting into the nitty-gritty nitty about, about the deal, man. Nelvana also did the uh, animation for Savage Dragon, and they were talking about maybe doing like an hour block where the characters can um, can pass through each each uh, series, just kind of like it happens in comics. But I think the way it worked out, and certainly the way it ha it aired in Pittsburgh, was um, Savage Dragon was on USA, mm -hmm. and Wildcats was like in syndication. I believe it floated. It could be on Channel Ten one week, and then disappear for two weeks and be on channel three the next you know like the next time it airs so uh i don't think it ever had like a steady home yeah the other uh cartoon that nelvana does is cadillacs and dinosaurs yeah which i think they were doing or just finished doing whenever they hooked up with jim lee and wildcats um he compared he makes a comparison at one point i think Fo fox CBS, whoever whoever they were doing this for originally, the plan was to have it go against the X Men, and he and he refers to it as a David and Goliath comparison, which I think is kind of interesting because the David and Goliath article on the Hulk title a couple pages before, right. <laughs> and then like we'll go you know probably another twenty years before we see David and Goliath in Wizard, let alone twice, <laughs> right? Nothing much else in this piece. No, I this. I don't think anybody thinks of this as a particularly successful cartoon, no. The Wildcats. No, but it is a very successful uh, opening theme song. <laughs> Here it is, man. This is why I thought that that Bad Rock was animatronic. It's like you got mm -hmm. that wide open mouth and then you got like this little, almost like little animation. It does look like it. And and I think I've seen it move somewhere. And it is like a very, like a slow move. It makes sense why you would think animatronic if you see, you know, I guess the guy inside of it operating it. It still is not like a person moving around. It's very stiff. And there was the Extreme Studios talent search uh, that we all participated in when we were young boys. We all lost, man, to Todd Nock. So, so his name is finally announced. And, of course, guest starring Pitt, because every Image comic guest stars Pitt. I think that comes back to we're not selling books the way we used to. Like, what do we do? Right. Joe and Jimmy's Excellent Adventure, man. Joe Quesada and Jimmy Palmiotti, they're going to jump headfirst into the self-publishing game and event comics. These two are interesting interesting guys. If you look at their career, you know, like we see so many people covered in Wizard Magazine. These two strike me as uh, a, a little bit of a different cut of guys because they are trying new things and continue to do it. You know, I just mentioned Liam Sharp still active in comics and stuff these two equally still active in comics and have been through a lot of different versions of trying things, creator own, you know, just a wide spectrum of experience through their comics career, much wider than most cartoonist or penciler inkers. Quesada seems like a savvy motherfucker from, yeah. from, from word go, man. And he has an agent when a lot of guys don't have agents uh, or who they do have is like that Mike Friedrich guy, and Mike Friedrich is signing co signing deals and getting those guys working without ever signing contracts. Um, it's Lowry, so funny you say it. Like I, I literally, my note is Quesada sounds business savvy. Right. Yeah. And uh, the agent um, is like running some figures and and shit, and is like, you know, you guys, you guys might be able to do something here. Um, they get into. And touch on a little bit of the sort of strife that Quesada had with uh, Valiant when it came to Ninjak, and he ultimately left. And then Palmiotti felt some type of way and didn't want to continue on Ninjak, man, but he stayed working on some other bullshit, uh, you know, Solar or some nonsense. Um, but then I think he disappeared from that 
uh, after some dramas and stuff. And, 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 you know, once again, that business savvy, he doesn't really get into it, man. Yeah, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but since you mentioned the Valiant, you know, the, these guys may be leaving Valiant on not, not the best terms. Yeah. We're going to see a, a, an upcoming article. I think the very next article is Bart Sears, and it's a similar type of article where he's starting his own company and characters and has a similar story about his experience of Valiant and leaving a run early and Valiant no comments in that article. But it does seem like something was... I don't know a miss between talent and Valiant at this time, or at least some of the talent in Valiant. And we've and we've covered Valiant in, in previous episodes. Uh, if 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 you had if you wanted to keep your dignity, uh, I I would bet you would have to stand up for yourself a time or two with those chuckleheads. So their plans are to launch their own company. Um, Event Comics is the name of the company. And uh, the big character that they're coming out with is Ash, which is a superhero fireman mashup. Yes. Which I actually think that that makes sense. I understand how you could arrive at that as a concept for a superhero character. And Quesada talks about this is a good time to start a company, even though the market is down. But it's a good time to start because, in his words, fans aren't as loyal to books. They're looking for something good. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's kind of an interesting time in comics if you picture, like, you go to the comic book store and there's a lot of different stuff vying for your attention. There are letters and things. Fans talk about it. It does seem like a time when people are just kind of looking around and picking out what looks cool. Um, So I don't know if he's right or not, but it's an interesting perspective on this idea that fans at this time are not loyal to books the way they used to be. Like when I was a kid, you'd be a Marvel zombie. Uh, I forget what the DC was, but, you know, they had some fanboy, you know, title as well. And the idea was like that's you were loyal to that, to that company, to that universe, certainly to the characters. And it seems like that's all gone at this point, or at least a lot of it is gone. This uh, taught me a lot about how to... uh script a page and i still basically if i if i show you my notebook it still kind of looks like this and i've just stared at these thumbnails it, these might be the first sketches i ever saw you know uh but looking at them now how do you read this <laughs> <laughs> the storytelling so different yeah yeah like like this is the worst like to have the unless, unless it's meant to be read like this if it's meant to be read like this, then then you got you got real issues. It better be meant to be read like that. <laughs> and we'll have to track down that issue, maybe. <laughs> I have a line that made me laugh. Yeah, they're talking about doing fi- research on firemen, you know, and going to like firehouses and talking to these dudes. And this is the quote: "Listening to these guys is like listening to an episode of a TV movie." It's that interesting. Yeah, yeah. is that a diss? Like, <laughs> right, that doesn't seem like an endorsement. <laughs> they must like Meredith Baxter Burney or whatever that lady's name is. That's a hell of a fireman right there, Emily. Kid, Kid Death is the... Uh, Kid Death and Fluffy are their other characters. And I think they did a maybe a one-shot or something with those characters. But They participated in, in these gimmicks, man. These, like... Well, mm. it, might, it might not be this one. I think it was the Creator Universe line, which was uh, the same okay. the same setup. It was a trading card set with, uh, you know, maybe it was a little better version than this one. Right. But <laughs> There the can't idea be was... one of anything. There has to be, like, the, the thing and then the knockoff versions of it. Listen, the competition is good for the customer. Yes. <laughs> and their idea was, we're going to, like, when everybody's doing this bravado machismo superheroes that they're creating, we're going to make, like... Uh, a, a little hellion kid and tell me if that ain't the most 90s looking design ever man like a lot of angst a little ragamuffin guns sneaks and a shirt that says i did your mom <laughs> <laughs> uh you feel it man we're getting close to on ominous press jimmy jimmy are you awake jimmy i was awake until we got to ominous press <laughs> <laughs> well we're fully there now man a new mythology Bart Sears takes Brutes and Babes off Wizard's drawing board to headline Ominous Press Comics. This is uh, one of the worst ideas I've ever heard of. I, For one thing, they go through and he's explaining the story and Brutes and Babes come from some unnamed planet. Whenever your main characters are named Brute and Babe, how do you not come up with a name for your planet? You're launching a company and you don't even know like where they live. And by the way, based on the titles of your characters, it could just be called Orb, uh, Sphere. <laughs> like, to, to, be, to be fair to Bart Sears, 
their their names are uh, Male and Aurora. Mm. Yes. Or maybe Aura. Is that their secret identity names? <laughs> I'm uh, uh, unclear what the brute and babe part of the equation is. They talk about the Monument Edition. The Monument Edition is how they plan to publish several of these titles. And what that is, he calls them tablets. It is an unbound book. So it's comic book size pages, but they're not bound in a book. They come in a plastic reusable sleeve. Think about that for a minute. So do you buy it, pull the Monument tablets out, throw them in the garbage, but keep the sleeve? Like, what do you mean it's reusable? It doesn't make any sense. There's 16 tablets, most of these books that he's describing, and several of them form a giant panel on the back, which means now you're getting 16 pages, only one side, since the back is just one big image, for 4 or $5 a set. Jim, P- Pittsburgh is a small place, man, and I, and it's it's hard for me to find other like dynamic people who are kind of like doing their own thing, running their own business and stuff, man. And I, and I try, and uh, throughout my entire life, man, I would meet people who were... They would, uh, they were developing their clothing line and it was this like real Ralph Cramden sounding scheme. And that's how this reads to me. It's like somebody with like fucking no clue, but maybe a couple dollars in the pocket, man, that could like try some things, dude. And it's just like, who's even looking for this? Here's a good quote from this. Ominous isn't going to be a writer's haven. No shit. (laughs) And, uh... (laughs) <laughs> There's there are job titles in this. There are, there are people who have the job titles in this article of marketing director and conceptual designer. This is a small indie publisher. What do you have a conceptual designer? What is this? You have a kid like creating your stuff and then you know you could slap your trademark on it like like It like looks like stepping. they have no designer either. <laughs> Here's one of their publications. Ooh. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to give a flip through there, Ed, you, you can see, like, there's no setting. There's no attention to what I would think of as, like, comic storytelling 101. Look at that background. And then look at that red text on red background. Yeah. I, like, I think even that is stupid. Critical of the lettering and the ads in the past, and at least it's consistent. I was a shorty at this time, dude, and I'm being introduced to all kinds of characters I never heard of with this magazine. And I promise you, when I saw this, I, w- I wasn't feeling it in the least, man. It's it's a weird one. It just feels so out of step with everything I think of as comics. I don't know when this would have ever appealed to me. If it didn't work then, you know what I mean? Like, I might rather read a Valiant comic than this. <laughs> and just looking at just the betrayal of, like lettering, storytelling, all of that. This dude, Bart Sears, went to the Cubert School for a minute, man. I feel like Joe would be disappointed if he if he saw this shit. I think I'm gonna throw that in the garbage now I, that I'm done with it. I know. I was, I was like <laughs> feeling like we should both rip ours up, man, <laughs> right on camera. You pull anything else, man? No, it's. I'm shocked by it. I'm shocked by the coverage. Obviously, he's connected to Wizard Magazine and he's bought ads, so of course he's gonna get the feature. But it is atrociously bad. Yeah. Let's have a palate cleanser, man, and talk Frank Frazetta for a minute. That's what you need. Whoever put this magazine together, once again, well done, because you do need this after that article. (laughs) So, Frank, once again, keeping up with the theme of licensing one's name to some shit. Before we do that, written by Brian Cunningham, the longtime toy columnist. He doesn't do that anymore, but Cunningham has has been like one of the gems of Wizard Magazine (laughs) reread to me. And no surprise, here's an article I like, and it's by a guy who we've sung his praises in the past. (laughs) Uh, so, so f- this might be the first mention of Frazetta, maybe, uh, in Wizard. That's probably not true, but definitely the first significant coverage. And uh, we get into his past a little bit, man. Started professionally as a boy, doing like uh, these like snowman comics when he's like fifteen or something. Caught the caught the eye of uh, of Al Cap, and was working on Lil Abner doing ghost work for like. Eight years, which is crazy. Like, like eight years of this immense talent forced to draw in another guy's style. Uh, from there, like, the EC thing happens, does some cool uh, sci-fi strips, is a part of the, uh, the, 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 either the Flegel Gang or the Flying Dutchman. I forget what the crew was called, <laughs> man, but it was Frazetta, Al Williamson, Roy Crankle, Angelo Torres, maybe one or two other guys, man. Badass guys. Man, what a what a crew of talent. And they uh if you see like the Fire and Ice documentary, 
uh, or no, it's called Painting with Fire, documentary about Frank Frazetta. Uh, he talks about his passion and love for baseball, just wants to play baseball. And a big part of that crew that they had together, it was about hacking out these stories fast. Uh, so that we could go out and play some ball and catch some movies and shit, man. So, like, when you see a Flegel Gang comic, you're looking at a comic that has, like, Frazetta women and Al Williamson men and Roy Crankle backgrounds, and they're all just passing these pages, like, back and forth, man. They have so much energy and so, so much charm to them, but it was all in the spirit of, like, batting these things out on a weekend, man, so that we could go out and play. Yeah, and he talks about it... You know, at this point, he's he's an older guy. Um, it's nice that this is an interview too, and not like a, just a profile or something, yeah. because he feels very real in it. But he talks about that. Um, you know, he's he's not a workaholic, and he does work fast. And as he gets older, baseball is still a passion, but it's grandkids. You know, it's like it's a life beyond uh, just sitting alone in a studio. Yeah, yeah, and and that's and that's a privilege you get, man. If you're uh, at the top of your your game, there's no the, 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 there's no close second, man. So you could you could you could live that life, and uh, they make mention here of the uh, Frazetta Museum run by his wife Ellie. I got to visit it, dude. Year two thousand, and Ellie showed us around, man. It was one of the uh, the the coolest things I've ever done in my life, man. He didn't sell most of his work uh, at that point, so. All the stuff I wanted to see was there. And, that is really cool. And uh, they had like all necessary security kind of pr protections for for the artwork that one could have in a gallery space. And I confess to tripping the alarm like three times <laughs> because I just kept getting closer and closer <laughs> to uh, some of these pieces. And the sensors like went off and she had to do, 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 hit the little number pad and, and, and good. And get, get the <laughs> I shit like going. hearing that super cool lady. Uh, he, he had one of his, um, he had a second stroke when we went there and he would not come out to see us. Mm. It was, it was a field trip from the Kubert school, but when it was time to split, get the fuck out of there, hopped on the bus, man. And it was like, he like, he popped out like, behind a tree like by his house and like waved us off dude it was it was a really it was a really cool thing and and you were talking about like the speed and and doesn't workaholic shit uh when he had the second stroke like i saw paintings that he did when he had the second stroke and I, i'm trying to imagine like exactly how she described it now i think what he would do because he like lost use of like the right side of his body and i think he's a right-handed guy uh, so I think I'm getting this right. He would tape the his brush into his right hand, but have to use his left to to kind of like move it around it and like steady it. And he did these uh, these like African paintings for for his wife, giant ones like like uh, full sized. And she said that he was like really mad and frustrated because like a painting that's like six foot high took him two weeks to do it's like that would take us a year yeah yeah for sure yeah it's heartbreaking you hear this about uh a lot of older artists you know suffering through whatever physical calamities but continuing to try to make work you know monet famously i think they would paint they would tape brushes in his hands mm -hmm. you know because his arthritis was so bad yeah it's uh it's heartbreaking i'm glad you got to see the museum reading this article that was something that like i'm disappointed i never made it to that museum um, it sounds amazing. And you mentioned having all those originals. At one point, he talks in this article about switching from, you know, he did a lot of paperback covers, switching from one of those companies to Lancer, the yeah. publisher. And one of the deals there, there was better pay, but you keep your originals, yeah. which was unheard of at that time. So part of the reason he's able to have, a, you know, have a museum later in life and have those originals on hand. So that's a pretty smart business move. You know, we see so many missteps by artists. That's a good move. That's that's uh, some forward thinking at the time. Um, there's some great quotes in here, too. Like, at, at one point, it's, um, demons and women and monsters and creatures, this is what I do. <laughs> it's, it's awesome. Um, and he made the most unbelievable things believable, is how he, he said he, he hopes he's remembered in terms as an artist, you know, saying he's not the best artist or whatever, but that's how he hopes uh, people will remember his art. And we're here to talk specifics, man. So the reason this whole piece is in Wizard Magazine at this uh, very moment is uh, Glenn Danzig 
threw Fra Frank Frazetta a bunch of money, man, to get the license to make a Death Dealer comic. It's Death Dealer, that's this character you see right here. And the idea that Frazetta had when he uh, when he painted this thing was he wanted he wanted to kind of paint a version of the Grim Reaper that like warriors would see. And he said it's it was his most successful painting. And one of the things, like, I sort of wonder, like, like, what does that mean? Does that mean uh, you had a lot of posters and, like, this poster sold more than everything? Uh, you, obviously, you license it out for things. But I would have loved to have heard specifics about what it is that makes this image the most popular Frazetta image. Yeah, it's a good it's a good question. And I don't know, maybe maybe something that would turn up in other interviews or something, because now I'm curious as well. Yeah. Yeah, uh, he also talks about painting telling a story in one image, mm -hmm. you know, compared to, say, a comic or something. And that's something I would like to unpack further. You know, we've talked to other people who do illustration. We talked to Ben Mara about, you know, who does a lot of illustration work about that idea of what is the different storytelling approaches uh, or styles or, you know, thought processes behind, say, an illustration versus a comic. So it's it's one of those things that's on my mind just because it's they look so similar in many ways, but of course they aren't. It's going to be uh, Simon Bisley, who's going to be the guy drawing a Death de la Comic. Should we give that a flip through, or is there more yeah, to talk about in the article? I, I think that's definitely worth a flip through, and that covers most of uh, most of what I pulled from here. You know, they do mention the uh, Fire and Ice movie. Yes. Have you ever seen it? I have. That's the Ralph Bakshi uh, collaboration. Yeah, he's never had like a a, um, a seamless collaboration with a cartoonist, man. Uh, when you're dealing with somebody, like Bakshi's an artist. When you deal with another artist, like a real artist, I don't know how that can end uh, nicely. But uh, Frazetta said of Bisley that he really likes the kid when he has some restraint. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder if we'll look into more Verotica at some point, Glenn Danzing's publishing company. I think it's pretty interesting, and the artist that he works with is a very nice collection of artists. Uh, Bisley is, is a guy he's done several projects with, um, you know, one of my favorites, so it's always fun whenever that pops up. Yeah, and Bisley even painted some, like, Danzig, like, album covers, I believe, too. There's the man himself. Look at look at the biz, man. <laughs> <laughs> Super cool. Did you pull anything else from the uh, Frazetta? No, just happy that it's in here. You know, it's, it's uh, again, one of the points of Wizard that I think is often overlooked is exposure to interesting artists like this. I don't know if I would have seen much written about Frazetta before this article. Yeah. I, I mean, I probably was mildly aware of him because he is such a big figure in comics and, and fantasy art. But an interview... Probably, probably definitely the first time I read an interview with him. This is definitely my first exposure to uh, Frazetta. I guess the one other thing worth mentioning is Cunningham asked him about photo reference, and he he said he said no. Like when he draws his figures and paints his figures, uh, there's he'll have none of that, um, which I found thought was interesting because you know the proportions on these figures are pretty good man i mean when you when you study the the muscles obviously he's making some he's kayfabing a little bit but yeah he's very good with light uh which is something that i think you would have trouble with not having photo references but it doesn't doesn't seem to you know hinder him in any way like i said it's one of the things that stands out with his work um i would add this it's not in the article but just from other interviews mike Mignola cites frazetta's paintings as a source of how he developed spotting blacks in his ink work so that's pretty noteworthy when you think of, you know, Mike Mignola's impact in comics. Kind of cool to see that connection. I feel like when he when Mignola says that, uh, he's he's talking composition. And, like, Frazetta is amazing at composition. And, and you could almost, like, this is almost like a Hellboy composition where it's, like, it stacking like figures mm -hmm. and then you have your Hellboy up there. Even the shape of those bears is almost Mignola-esque. Right. And, and that's just, like, something... When you study... Uh, Frazetta work, man. Like, it's his compositions that, like, really, really stick out to me. Toying around. Sean Ons, the man of the hour, writing about the Youngblood toys that are going to be coming out from uh, Todd Toys. Still hasn't been called uh, McFarlane Toys yet. I had this Bad Rock figure. There was also a chapel and there was a Dutch. I had the Dutch, not the chapel. <laughs> Fun to see the sketches. 
I was trying to figure out if they're McFarlane artwork or not. I'm, I'm, I, I, it, I don't think so. I don't either. I, these are these are like, you know, getting the proportions right for the sculptor is very important, and I don't know that those guys could have that di- level of discipline to. To keep, yeah, it's probably not caged. worth his time. Like, you know, whatever he's getting paid, it's probably not worth his time to be the guy doing the model sketches right. at that detail level. Has there been a McFarlane Toys art book? Because, man, so. imagine the amount of sketches and artwork that have come out of that that company. Yeah, yeah, good call, man. Uh, this, this month's Homemade Heroes, I think it's fucking awesome, man. Like, this, <laughs> this looks like pro to me, man. Like, these could be legit Barbies. Yeah, that's a good. That's a that's a real smart idea. And uh, on the right facing page, we have a Wizards of the Coast customer service line, and it's a nine panel comic uh, that features like a guy from like the customer service line at Wizards of the Coast, just like constantly telling people that their Magic the Gathering cards uh, are gonna are gonna you know get to them soon at, at like their soonest. Con- earliest convenience all of that and and i was reading about the history of the magic cards and it's and it's, it's pretty fa- fascinating stuff man they were uh in uh wizards of the coast was a game company they were in litigation with some of the established game companies because they created like game packs that could work with other systems from like a dungeon of dragons or like a Steve Jackson Games or something, and they were getting sued by Palladium, the people who did yeah. the Turtles and the and the Starenko one. So they created a shell company uh, called Garfield Games, where uh, this guy Rich Garfield is the guy who, like, straight up mathematician, math wizard, grad student, uh, created Magic to gather and like they so they had it in this Garfield Games, the shell company of Wizard of the Coast, and then. Uh, Wizard like licensed Garfield Games to like do the Magic the Gathering so that the money could go back to the main company and avoid all those entanglements. Magic has some very interesting business backgrounds. They were profiled on I want to say Planet Money, but it might be Freakonomics or one of these other shows, one of these podcasts, and it talks about some some of their decision making early on that enabled them to have the long life that they have and to have like variations in value in cards. It's it's very interesting the the Magic the Gathering history. I don't play Magic. Yeah. I don't know much about it. Yeah, but the fact that it crosses over into these other areas where like you know business podcasts are analyzing their history and decision making to me stands out. Yeah, they, like they weathered the storm of of being a fad to the point that they were able to buy TSR the Dungeons and Dragons people, and then they sold at a good time to Hasbro. So it's like they made all right decisions constantly. This, this month's Palmer's Picks, Jay Stevens, man. Atomic Amazement. And uh, I confess that I never was able to get my hands on very many Jay Stevens comics, dude. Yeah, Jay Stevens is a guy that's a little bit before my time. I think he might have gone into animation for a bit. That, that, you know, like that might have been what he was doing when I would have been buying these kinds of comics. Yeah. So, like, I have friends who were into alternative comics you know maybe the decade before i really got into them they love jay stevens you know like he definitely has this big fan base yeah so he did many comics to start i guess that would be his sin comics and what is being promoted now uh really is atomic city tales this is pretty much the issue that you can get uh it must have been the most popular because I've never seen another issue <laughs> of Atomic City Tales in the back issue bins, man. I see a little bit of like a Mike Mike Allred, uh, you know, probably I'm sure was a fan of Jay Stevens. I think they may have even done some creative stuff together, inking each other or, or something along those lines. Yeah, I think for uh, AAA Pop or whatever the Atomics uh, brand was, uh, Jay Stevens had a little tour uh, in there or something. And... You know, he did work in uh, some THB as well, so he was kind of like a cartoonist cartoonist, man. Like, if I can show off the, uh, the piece he did in THB. He also has, has the distinction of doing superheroes from an alternative comics standpoint, which now is common, but back then nobody was really doing that. Alternative comics and superhero comics were definitely separate worlds. And, uh, and he was one of those guys that was bridging that, that early guy to bridge that gap. I love this, uh, this approach 
with like the black uh, Prismacolor color pencil on like the toothy paper to get that texture. You didn't see that that much in these old comics. But we'll be unpacking some THB at a later date. In the recommended reading, it's kind of like the bibliography of Jay Stevens, Atomic City Tales, Sin, Sin Comics, Sputnik and Reactor Girl, and then uh, a bunch of his little stuff. Like he, he did strips in Nickelodeon Magazine and uh, places like this, man. He also did an alternative uh, alt-weekly strip, Oddville. Mm. So he was a very active cartoonist and did quite a bit of work. Um, again, it's kind of a time period because once he gets into, I believe it's animation that pulls him away from comics for a bit. And we should say he's still active, like he just released a book recently. So still active in the comic scene. So Tom Palmer has a pick of the month. It's uh, Roarin' Rick's Rare Bit Fiends, the Rick Veach uh, Dream Comic Series. Uh, we'll cover that because that'll be a Palmer's pick and get the full, the full Monty uh, eventually. But Jay Stevens has some recommended reading here. It's a good list, man. Acme Novelty Library, Chris Ware, Hectic Planet by Evan Dorkin, Pickle by Dylan Horrocks, uh, Jim by Jim Woodring, Serial Killings by uh, the Center for Cartoon Studies, Graham Puba, James Sturm, Madman of Comics by Mike Allred, and Hellboy by Mike Mignola. Wizard Comic Watch, we have Deathmate Black, and they make it a point to say, this comic is definitely not worth uh, buying for the story. <laughs> it's worth buying because it's the first appearance of Gen 13. Yes, the, the somewhat controversial first appearance. There's some debate on the actual first appearance. I think this was published first, but the story is that, you know, this is a what-if story. It didn't really happen. Ah, so uh, I think there's there are, you know, pe people will debate that in, in as time moves forward. X-Force number 32, artist Tony Daniel, writer K. Fabian Nicieze. <laughs> <laughs> One half of the comic book Mulkey Brothers, the other half being Scott Jobdale. <laughs> well done. Yes, sir. <laughs> and uh, I guess this is in here because it has something to do with Generation X, Paige Guthrie, uh, Cannonball's little sister. What I will say, though, is that it is early Tony Daniel art. He's a guy who's still rocking it in comics, and he's going to rise to prominence when he does the uh, the Alan Moore Spawn mm -hmm. comic, Blood Feud, when I'm quite sure, man, like, I don't think Todd McFarlane would ever admit this to me, man, but that question was posed in, like, a letters page on, on an issue of Spawn. What if Spawn got bitten by a vampire? And I just feel like <laughs> Todd was like... Light bulbs went off. He was like, "Yeah." <laughs> he was like, "Hey, Alan." Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tony Daniel. Glad you you pull out his name here. So of course, Rob Liefeld launches X Force. Very popular artist. Greg Capullo then comes on when Liefeld leaves. Yeah. Who goes on to be a very popular artist. Continues to be a very popular artist. Tony Daniel has a good run, and he's followed, I think, by Adam Polina, who's another cartoonist who, at least stylistically, I appreciate. It feels like that's a pretty good run for artist. Uh, on X Force, um, even some of the the other X books don't fare as well, in my opinion. Yeah, listen, man, I'm even down with that Mark Pasella, Dan Panosian, like uh, Cable as Terminator. Face. I like that one. That, that that's maybe one particular issue, but uh, that's a fun, weird style. The Mark Pasella Do, sort of aping Rob Liefeld. Yeah, doing their Gilberg to to <laughs> Liefeld. Ultra Force One. Are you going to pull that one up for us to flip through, Jimmy? <laughs> I am not. I am not. <laughs> Gen 13 Zero. You pull anything from these, man? No, I didn't. Not not the best month for the uh, comics watch. No, At sir. least not for, from my standpoint. No, sir. Top books for August 1994. Gen 13 One. Uh, this is the miniseries. Uh, Death Blow 5. Lady Death 1. She 1. So we're getting... That's three girl books. Kindred 3, Wildcats 11, Stormwatch 10, Catwoman 12, another uh, girl book, Vampirella number 1 is in the ninth spot, and then, <laughs> you know, they had to give one to uh, Patrick Daniel O'Neill. This is a funny list. So and obviously the bad girl trend is is alive and well in Wizard Magazine at this point. We saw it in the fan art 
page, and now we're seeing it in the top 10. Yeah. The other dominant piece here are these Wildstorm variant covers. Yes. So the variant cover thing, I, you know, I was trying to figure this out. Is this when variant covers really kind of become prominent as a way of generating heat on a book? You know, in the earlier uh, issues, there would be that profit cover that uh, Stephen Platt did that uh, was for an issue that he didn't do the interiors for. And that was in the number one spot for a minute. So these guys are doing everything they can to sell books. It's like this to this day. Yeah, that's this the is, sad This part. is still the gimmick, man. And if it's not a variant cover like this, it, they, then they just want you know want to show Bat, Batman's dick. Um, in the Wizard Market article here, they talk about the first Bone comic in color is coming up, and it's going to run in the uh, in the Disney Adventures, um, which we had mentioned earlier. I think in a news item, not this issue, but earlier in, in our Wizard coverage, Bone being in Disney Adventures being like the big exposure of Bone, and then adding color to it is probably another piece that. When you think of Bone today and its success, that's kind of all of it. That's the blueprint right there. You know, it's the color and it's the combination of a, of a bigger publisher with kind of a bigger footprint. Um, we get to see the trial run here in 1994. The issue basically closes out with the Ego article by Todd McFarlane about Todd Toys. Mm-hmm. And in previous issues, the aforementioned uh, Brian Cunningham, who had the toy article, he did a little article about, like, the genesis of the creation of a toy. And if I remember correctly in that Brian Cunningham piece, it was um, a company makes a deal with a publisher, uh, a handshake is is made, and then uh, toys come back from China in a few months or something. In this article... Todd gets a little bit deeper. Not too deep, but he at least adds a few steps to the process, man. And talks about how they create prototypes that are, you know, a, a foot high, two times the size of the actual figure. They send that stuff to, uh, to uh, China. The prototypes come back. They paint the things, send it back, and then they sort of go from there. He warns people that they may have to run around to, like, accumulate the figures because they're only able to make so many man when when you're when you're doing a venture like this your upfront money is finite so so they're gonna you know get their initial print runs of these figures or whatever they would call them and you know toys r us is going to get the bulk and it's going to trickle down uh but there are different venues like comic shops like the direct market is a possibility uh, i remember picking mine up from kmart um, but eventually you'll be able to get all of them. Yeah, this is a fun article. This is another, I, w one thing I enjoy in these wizard rereads is seeing the stuff that we know goes on to be successful, watching it like build and grow, um, very good use of his column, you know, walking us through this. I think there was a huge amount of interest in this kind of thing, as you see from like the homemade figures and stuff, um, you know, it's it's very like zeitgeisty, like right time, right place, right artist. Even you know, nobody had a bigger spotlight than McFarlane, and it seemed to really tap into the thing that, as comic sales are dipping, the toy market is is not. You right. know, like there's a lot of excitement and interest around that, and right place, right time, smart. You know, whatever it is, maybe a little bit lucky. All of these things work together, uh, but you see them culminate as he's putting this toy company together, and it's it's pretty fun seeing this happen. At the time, nobody knew if this would be successful. Nobody knew if these toys would be any good. It was just a lot of interest. Um, knowing what we know now, it's like, wow, this is this is foundational stuff. Yeah, I I mean, if we think about the Image Founding Fathers, and we'll just say uh, because of their high-selling books, uh, McFarlane, Liefeld, and Lee, when they started Image, we'll say that they were basically starting at the same position. The crazy thing is, I don't know about Jim Lee's status if he if he was a father at that point, but Todd McFarlane had a had a family, you know he had he had kids to support and everything, but he took these entrepreneurial steps that really probably make him the richest guy in comics, uh, who is from a creative capacity, man, uh, and that's on the strength of these toys, man. It's it's not from you know drawing Spider Man. 
Now that would be seed money. Totally. Totally. And then it closes out with a piece about uh, Jim Salakrup, who was, I believe, Todd McFarlane's editor on the Spider-Man, the adjective list Spider-Man title. And Amazing. Oh, was he on mm -hmm. Amazing as well? And uh, would always butt heads in the letters column whenever uh, Todd would answer uh, letters to the dissatisfaction of uh, Salakrup. I wonder how much of that is gimmick. Cafe, you know, keeping it kayfabe because it is entertaining. It does make those letter columns entertaining, and and we've talked about different letter columns over the years. Uh, I think there's no kayfabe. This guy right here is a <laughs> fucking peckerwood. Well, at this point, he is uh, editor in chief, I believe, at Top Comics, which is what I th I'm the reason they're running this piece. Yeah. I didn't know this before reading this profile. This might be the first time I've gotten anything out of these profiles. He helped start the Comics Interview magazine, which would have been, you know, an '80s. There, there were several of these magazines in the 80s. Uh, I don't know how to describe them. They're, not, they're, they're kind of a cross between fan magazines and trade magazines. After mags. Comics Interview is one of those. And, uh, and Jim Salakrip was one of like the co-founders of the Comics Interview. So I thought that was kind of interesting because you don't see these kinds of publications now. They don't really exist. But in the 80s, there were several of them, like Amazing Heroes, Comics Journal, obviously, and, and quite a few others. This one was there at like such a critical time in comics, and then they would get like an Alan Moore or a Frank Miller and sit them down for you know a 30-page interview or something. And it was shit. It was like the most <laughs> missed opportunities. Uh, and I, I, I love that era as much as you. And I go out and I pick, I pick up that one that has like the Frank Miller on the cover with the with the uh, little girl Robin and shit. Yes. So stoked to like get some nitty gritty, and I am just want to rip the fucking magazine apart. So I see this. <laughs> I never saw this one, and it's like cool. You got Bill Sienkiewicz at the height of his superpowers on on Electra. I would love to read this, and I'm sure they're going to ask him, you know, what his favorite Jack Kirby or like you know like just bullshit. They don't know the question. They don't know what they need to be asking. <laughs> And I think I'm going to close out this issue, Jim, saying that this is probably the coolest solitaire ever looked. <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> when I saw this, dude, I was like, I'll fuck with that comic, man. Like, let me go find that. You find an issue of solitaire, it's a big pile of hokum. Do you know who that is? Is that Joe Jusco? I don't. Yeah, I don't know. I can't, I can't tell. I can't, it's not, I can't it doesn't no. quite look like Jusco to me totally. But I was I was going to say... Uh, Stealth Freeze? I was going to say, like... Uh, Texiera, like with some of this stuff, but that doesn't feel right because it's not Texiera enough. Yeah, it doesn't totally line up with anybody I can think of. There are little glimpses of styles, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. You're right, though. It's a good image of him. <laughs> it's better than he ever looks. So we'll cut the hell out uh, of this episode of Cartoonist Kayfabe, and you guys are going to want to stick around next week for issue 38 of Wizard when we get into a pretty awesome uh, Tim Truman interview, man. Sounds good, Ed. Let's get the heck out of here. K Fabers, like, subscribe, and follow the YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon so that you can be notifi notified whenever we have new videos available, and it'll also notify you when we have live streams going on. You never know who we're going to be talking to on these things. You can find Cartoonist K Fab merch at our spread shop. There's a link below the video to that. Jim, to break kayfabe, we're pulling it on all nighter, man. I need to go to sleep. Let's give these guys their marching <laughs> orders. Read more comics. <laughs>